the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Her Excellency Kamla Persad Bissessar. And I invite her to address the General Assembly. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Secretary General, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. First, I want to offer thanks and congratulations to His Excellency John Ash of Antigua and Barbuda, who during his tenure as president laid the foundation and conditions for elaboration of a new development agenda geared towards influencing sustainable development of members of this assembly. To you, Mr. President, congratulations on your election to preside over this 69th session of the UNGA. Sir, your election comes at a time when the global family faces very serious threats from the Ebola virus, as well as from what I call the terrorist virus, calling upon us all to marshal our human, financial, and other resources in a global partnership to combat these modern plagues. The election, sir, also comes as we are about to commence the second phase in the elaboration of the post-2015 development agenda. I am confident, as I'm sure we all are, that you will administer and lead with distinction. Today, it is a privilege to share with you all our perspectives coming from the government of Trinidad and Tobago, our priorities for the delivery and implementation of a transformative post-2015 development agenda in accordance with the theme aptly selected by you, Mr. President. Last year, we considered how we would set the stage to begin the process to be launched during this 69th section on the finalization of the post-2015 development agenda. I noted then that with the adoption of the Millennium Declaration and the introduction of the MDGs, a new chapter had been opened for the United Nations. That chapter would see the UN position as a vehicle to assist developing countries, especially the most vulnerable, in their efforts to help reduce poverty and hunger and provide an enabling environment for states to develop their economies so that their people could rise out of persistent poverty. Measures must be put in place now to spur a proactive rather than reactive approach to the issue of development in this transformative post-2015 development agenda. With the experience of challenges and lessons from the past 14 years with the impl implementation of the MDGs, we are now at a critical juncture in putting into operation the elements we agreed to at Rio Plus 20 so that they can constitute the future we want. The current model was built on what we agreed to at the Millennium Summit, but in some ways has fallen short of the expectations of many developing countries. However, for the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago, we have been able to achieve this objective because it forms an integral part of our medium-term policy framework 2011. And so we incorporated and aligned the MDGs and their targets with Trinidad and Tobago's medium-term national priorities. Consequently, some of the goals, targets, and indicators were modified in the light of Trinidad and Tobago's unique development circumstances and achievement of several of the MDGs. This approach resulted in, for example, modified targets for education with the pursuit of universal early childhood education and a 60% participation, participation rate at tertiary education. However, Excellencies, I'm very delighted to say that we have surpassed many of our own targets, as well as having surpassed some of the MDGs. And so we do have now in Trinidad and Tobago, we do have free primary school education, universal education. We do have free universal secondary education. 
And we, as I've said, we've surpassed our target of 60% in the tertiary sector. We have now surpassed that, and we are at 65% participation in the tertiary sector, that too being free education. <laughs> I am also pleased to underscore that my country is well poised to achieve 70% of the 43 targets across eight goals which are considered to be relevant to the national context. This percentage comprises 42% of targets which have already been met and 28% which are likely to be met by 2015. And so we say with good success and lessons learned, our work is therefore cut out for us. I turn now to share a few moments on CARICOM development. Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. President, as part of the regional community of the CARICOM and as part of the global community, we welcome the outcomes of the various milestones in the process that we have achieved to date. As a member of CARICOM, we were an active participant in the Open Working Group on the Sustainable Development Goals. We were therefore witnesses to the sweeping and unprecedented global participation and interest in that process and its outcome. As a collective effort, the crafting of the Sustainable Development Goals undoubtedly captured the spirit of openness, inclusiveness, partnership, all of which underpin this new phase of policy design and implementation. Along with the report of the Intergovernment Committee of Experts on Sustainable Development Financing, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals adopted in July of this year form a solid foundation. It is my respectful view that in delivering on and implementing a transformative post-2015 development agenda, we must and should prioritize key issues for this session of the UNGA. I would uh, seek to identify four priorities in this regard. The first priority, I believe, is for us to renew our commitment to achieving the MDGs. Even in the one year left, we can advance our original objectives to a greater extent with more dedicated effort. As the MDG GAP Task Force report highlights, although progress has been made in some areas, gains must be accelerated and a renewed effort is required in some areas to close the glaring gaps that continue to exist. Some of these gaps include, very important, access to affordable essential medicines in health, long-term debt sustainability, in particular for small states, as an essential element of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development. Implementation will be a key measure of our commitment to the aspirations for the post-2015 development agenda. Priority two, operationalizing the future we want. In the Rio 20 plus 20 conference in 2012, we agreed on many of the foundation elements of the post-2015 development agenda. We now have, therefore, coming out of that, several key documents to further inform and guide us as to the way forward. We have, for example, the Secretary General's Global Sustainability Report. We have the Sustainable Development Goals. We have the report of the Intergovernmental Com Inter Committee on Sustainable Financing, and we also have the outcomes of the structured dialogues on a specialized technology mechanism and the 10-year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production. The future we want also outlines some key emerging challenges which we need to urgently address in the context of the post-2015 development agenda. Some of these issues, as you will recall, include non-communicable diseases, the increasing urgency to address climate change, and the imperative of addressing the needs of marginalized groups, including women, youth, children, of course, and persons living with disabilities. These building blocks of the future, we want to form the basis for the post-2015 development agenda. Together with the institutional support of the high-level political forum, 
and Sustainable Development, the Reform Economic and Social Council, and the United Nations Environment Assembly, we have a solid foundation for the fashioning of a global partnership in support of poverty eradication through sustainable development. We look forward to the synthesized report of the SG, which will place all of these elements in the context of a fully integrated post-2015 development agenda and give due consideration to the needs of countries in special situations, including small island developing states, least developed countries, and landlocked developing countries and Africa. As a specialized conference mandate in the future we want, the outcome document of the recently concluded third international conference on small island developing states, the Samoa pathway, should also be appropriately addressed in the report of the SG. The third priority is for us to revitalize the global partnership in support of sustainable development. The report of the Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on Financing for Sustainable Development have highlighted, has highlighted that current financing and investment patterns will not deliver sustainable development. In fact, it goes on to say, and I quote, while design and implementation of policies, policies will be on the national level, achieving sustainable development will require international support and cooperation. These are the core prerequisites for a global partnership in support of sustainable development. However, in order to make such a partnership meaningful, it is my respectful view that it must include, one, reform in the international financial institutions, targeting systemic failures and focusing on building resilience with sustained growth in open and vulnerable economies. And secondly, successful completion to the Doha round of trade negotiations, which will ensure that the rules of trade and commerce do not continue to operate so as to slow or impede or negate development gains and aspirations in our very small and vulnerable economies. I note that the third international conference on finances for development is scheduled to take place in July 2015. This will be critically important for ensuring that a meaningful and effective global partnership for development will become a reality for the implementation of post-2015 development agenda. On the point of a revitalized global partnership in support of sustainable development, I wish to strongly reiterate the support of Trinidad and Tobago for an end to the economic embargo against Cuba. The, the perpetuation of these measures against a developing country undermines our collective aspirations for a post-2015 development agenda where no one should be left behind. Our fourth priority is for us to address the mitigation gap for achieving the below 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees Celsius target for limiting the increase in global greenhouse gas emissions and achieving an ambitious legally binding agreement on climate change in 2015 to be applied from 2020. This agreement should set the world on track to achieving carbon neutrality by 2017 and by so doing ensure that the global climate will support the sustainable development of present as well as future generations. Our collective action on climate change should take into account the survival of most vulnerable states, in particular, such as our small island developing states, as the front line of increasingly severe impacts of climate change. It should also be firmly rooted in the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, recognizing the developing countries' finance needs for mitigation and adaptation to climate change cannot be met exclusively from domestic resources given the competing demands 
on public finance. I believe every head of government, every head of state would recognize those competing